else you need, as you may have guessed, I am not Pastor Brian. Um, You're a Buckeye. I'm a Buckeye, yep, that's true, yeah. O-H-I-O. All right, you guys are just jealous of the national championship. Um, as you know, Pastor Brian likes to start every Friday morning with a joke. Um, I was not planning on being in this role this morning, so I don't have a joke prepared. But as it turns out, the reason that Pastor Brian is not here is kind of our joke. He's currently at Del Nor trying to pass a kidney stone. Yeah. We've got photo evidence, so we're going to put this up there. So there he is. I think this is post some medication. So he is... Uh, He's maybe starting to feel a little bit better right about now. I talked to him about 15 minutes ago, and uh, he had gone from the I'm in severe pain to I feel great mode. So um, we'll, we'll be praying for him and, and uh, hopefully everything. How many of you guys have passed a kidney stone? All right, so you know. Yep. I've passed three of them. It's the worst, I know. We do have a video clip. We, we, what we're going to do this morning is I'm going to show in just a minute the movie clip that Brian has chosen for this morning. It's a scene out of the um, Western movie Tombstone with Val Kilmer and uh, um, what's that other guy's name? Anyways, it's a Western movie with Val Kilmer. Um, it's, the end, it's the end scene. Actually, it's a little bit ironic when you know the context of this morning, but um, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. And then we were able to find um, a team session from a few years ago that Pastor Brian taught on. It's not exactly our topic for the, uh, this morning, but it's similar. So we're going to use that for our content this morning. I'll come up and kind of lead us into the discussion time, and then we'll go from there. So um, check out this clip from Tombstone. Investigating the mysteries of the Church of Rome. It appears my hypocrisy knows no bounds. You're no hypocrite, Doc. You just like to sound like one. I brought you something. Well, let's see. Where are we today? Yeah, I'm $17 down to you. Two bits of hand, stud. I keep coming back here. I told you not to in a minute. Cause you're the only person I can afford to lose to anymore. How are we feeling today, Doc? I'm dying. How are you? Pretty much the same. So now we had self-pity the old lips of frailty. All right, Doc. All right, how many cards you want? I don't want to play anymore. How many? Damn, you're the most fallible, stubborn, self-deluded, bullheaded man I've ever known in my entire life. I call. You win. Yeah, with all, you're the only human being in my entire life ever gave me hope. She was 15. We were both so. That's good, Doc. That's, that's good. What happened? She joined the convent over the affair. She was all I ever wanted. What did you want? to live a normal life. There's no normal life, why? It's just life. You get on with it. Don't know how. Sure you do. Say goodbye to me. Go grab that. 
bearded actress make her young. Take that beauty and run. Don't look back. Live every second. Live right up the hill. Live why? Live for me. Why? If you ever my friend, if you ever had even the slightest feeling for me, leave now. Leave now. Please. Thanks for always being there, Doc. subject for today and um, the word was going to be on a legacy of faithfulness and the uh, the clip was meant to set up just the nature of the relationship between the two of them and if you know the story um, Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday um, basically take on this this criminal uh, organization and stand by each other through all of it and this is sort of this culmination as their relationship is coming to end. And even that phrase there at the end, you've always been there for me, Doc. Like, he recognizes the nature of the relationship. And similarly, then, our call to, to be faithful in, in relationships and what God has called us to, what he has put in front of us. Um, the video that we have for today is, is not exactly going to be on the topic of of faithfulness. I believe it's from a series that we did a couple years ago called What's in a Word? And the word of the day was on faith. Um, Pastor Brian thought of this. He thought it would tie in well. So we're going to hear his teaching from a couple years ago, and then um, we'll, we'll get into the discussion questions following that. So here's Pastor Brian from that series on faith. I couldn't really find a place to cut that off because I really wanted to watch the whole thing. It just kills me not to watch the whole thing once you see that much of it. Um, I think I made a, I think I misspoke. It's not the cliffs of despair, it's the cliffs of insanity. It's the pit of despair, if you know anything about the movie. Um, but that movie, uh, I, I will use that clip uh, for the word faith. Uh, I'm going to come back to it a little bit later. But we've been looking at uh, telling the story of the Bible basically one word at a time. And you're thinking, you know, that's going to take a long time, one word at a time. But the words we're looking at are the most important words uh, as we go through Scripture. And we've looked at the word holiness, looked at the word glory, sin, wrath, God's response to our sin, gospel, uh, God's gift to, that, that takes care of our sinfulness, heart, where all that work takes place. Last week, repentance, which is the change of mind, change of heart. And today we're looking at the word faith. Now, if you open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, we're only going to read one verse today, and the rest of chapter 11 is going to be your homework during the week. And it's one of the great chapters of the Bible, one of the more fascinating chapters of the whole Bible. But let me read this first verse to you from Hebrews chapter 11. It's the clearest definition, simplest definition of the word faith in all of Scripture. The Apostle Paul is writing, he says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now, if you have a King James Bible or you grew up with the King James Bible, that translation says, Now faith is the substance of of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And if you have the Revised Standard Version, which is a translation I like to use for academic purposes, it says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, the, uh, the word that the, uh, translated out of the Greek into uh, uh, to faith is the Greek word pistis, and it occurs 20, uh, 243 times in the New Testament. And it carries the, the primary meaning of being persuaded, uh, uh, trust, or faith. And in the ancient secular world, uh, pistis was a word used to refer to a guarantee or to a warranty 
on a product or on a business transaction. And I'm going to say three things about faith that it help us uh, understand what the biblical concept of faith is. First is that faith is built on truth. Faith is built on truth, according to the Bible. Uh, you've probably all seen when you're watching a Monday Night Football game or Sunday Night Football, these beer commercials now that are about uh, superstitions, sports superstitions. There's one where these guys are all sitting in the end zone, and they're having their whatever, Bud Light or whatever it is, and there's a field goal being kicked, so they all turn their labels so it's facing uh, toward the kicker because one guy says it's uh, the, the, beer, the beer labels all lined up together create a gravitational vortex that draw the ball through the uprights, and they all turn them that way, and the ball goes through. And one guy says, yeah, it's just like magic, only real, he says. And uh, that line, it strikes me, is how many people think about faith. Many people assume faith is like magic. It's believing what you know isn't true, that it's a fairy tale, that it's a superstition that weak or religious people create to make themselves feel better about a world they can't comprehend and can't understand. That's what Sigmund Freud believed when he called it an illusion in a, in a piece of writing called The Future of an Illusion. Karl Marx called uh, religion or faith the opiate of the masses, that which, that which uh, helps people feel better even though it's not true. That's not what the Bible teaches about faith. The Bible teaches that faith is built on truth. Notice the language of Hebrews chapter 1. Sure, certain. Faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. Other translations, substantive, substance, evidence. So the Bible is teaching us about truth and a faith that is built on that truth. Let me talk about two areas uh, where... Uh, are critical with regard to truth. The Bible teaches the truth about God. Genesis tells us that God is the creator of heaven and earth. Okay, that, that seems like a small thing, but if you look at the world today, you have to begin with faith somewhere. You have to begin with some kind of truth, and that begins with where did everything come from? I saw a, a, the tail end of a movie the other day at the fitness center. I was on my walking on the elliptical, and I, I, I watch because it helps me pass the time. And it was some movie. I don't know. I don't know what it was about. I don't know the title of the movie, but it was a space movie, and, and it came to its uh, culmination. Uh, and I kind of was trying to piece the story together. And the human, they're astronauts on Mars. Okay, when they're on Mars, and they discover life on Mars. Furthermore, they discover that. The, that life on Mars, these aliens on Mars, there was one alien left on Mars who told the story about how Mars at one time had been inhabited by life, got hit with an asteroid, they all had to escape, and part of their escape from Mars to another planet was seeding the young Earth with DNA so that Earth could have life. That was the story of the movie. And I thought, hmm, interesting. Any fifth grader knows how to ask the next question. Where did the aliens come from? Where did Mars come from? There had to be a beginning somewhere. The Bible says that God is the creator of heaven and earth. The Bible teaches in Romans that God can be known. That God can be known from what has been made. That human beings are being gifted with intelligence to look at what has been made and infer there must be a creator to all that has been made. Um, there, there's a standard of truth about God. Uh, God has revealed himself in Scripture as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You know, every world religion teaches something different about God. The Christian Bible, the, the Holy Bible, is the only religious book in the world that teaches God has revealed himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The only God who reveals himself as both holy and gracious. There are world religions that teach the concept of God as gracious and loving, but not holy. We're no standard of sin. There are other religions that teach God as holy, but with no access to grace and mercy and forgiveness. The God of the Bible reveals himself to be a God that is holy and a God that is loving and gracious, and that's the gospel. There's a standard of truth about God, and that relies on the truth of his word. We must have a standard for truth, uh, and I'll talk about this in a minute later, in a, in a bit later. How can we have confidence in the Bible as the word of God as a standard for truth as to what we build our faith on? Well, I was thinking about this the other day, and uh, every now and then I have to replace something in my car. And I hate doing work like that because I don't know anything about it. Just, just replacing a bulb for a, a headlamp or a taillight is, is, a, is, a, is a huge, enormous, gigantic task for me. So, and I don't know how to do it. So I have to get out my owner's manual to look to see how to do that because I always forget, you know, year to year how to do that sort of stuff. So how do I have faith that that, that, that that owner's manual is telling me the truth? Well, if I get out the owner's manual and I, I'm holding it there, I'm looking at my car, and it says, twist this nut this way, and, I, and, and, the, and the nuts are there, and do that. If, if it corresponds to the reality that I experience, 
If that owner's manual corresponds to what I see, I get more and more confidence in the owner's manual. If it says this will be there and it's not there, I, I lose confidence in that owner's manual. Well, the Bible is the Word of God gives us confidence because it corresponds to our reality. It corresponds to how, how I see myself. It corresponds to what I know about myself so we can have confident, confidence in it as the truth. There's a guy named Hugh Ross, who I mentioned here now and then. I read his books years ago. He's a Christian astrophysicist, and his story is one that's worth reading. He has a website called reasonstobelieve.com. Hugh Ross is a double Ph.D., astrophysicist. He's also a Christian. But his story of how he came to faith is all about what I'm talking about right here. Hugh Ross grew up in a non-church-going uh, home, an ah-religious home. Uh, moral parents, but didn't go to church, didn't have any, uh, any loyalty in any particular religion. But he was kind of a child prodigy. By age seven and eight, he was reading books on physics and astrophysics. By the time he was 15, he had read pretty much all the books he could read in the public library in Toronto, Canada, about physics. Uh, and he had discovered, without ever going to church or ever seeing, hearing about God, that uh, the universe had a beginning and therefore must have a beginner. He just didn't believe that beginner could be known. And he was curious, so he began to read the holy books of the world to see who could teach him where everything came from. And so he began to read uh, books from all the world religions. This is only about 17 or 18 years old. And he said he noticed right away when picking up a religious uh, a holy book like the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita or something like that, he could tell within a few days of reading when it didn't match his experience, what he knew about science, what he knew about the universe. And he would put it aside until he came to the Bible. He said he read the first 12 verses of the Bible, having never seen it before, never been to church, and he thought he knew immediately that whoever wrote this book knows how the universe started. And here's his quote. He said, uh, not only did its author correctly describe the major events in the creation of life on earth, but he placed those events in the right order and properly identified the earth's initial conditions. He said the Bible was so specific and so detailed about what he had perceived that it matched the reality he saw that he thought whoever to uh, wrote this is telling the truth, therefore I'll trust the rest of it. And when he got to the part of the Bible that talked about Christ, he became a Christian without ever going to church. Just simply by wrestling with truth. So faith is built on truth. Now let me talk for a moment about truth. The nature of truth is that all truth is by definition exclusive in some way. And that's important to say because one of the great myths of our culture today in North America is that we as individuals can create our own truth. Truth by definition is discovered, not created. Uh, truth is not subjective, it's objective. Uh, we like to say in our culture, you hear it all the time. Those of you who watch Oprah will hear it all the time on Oprah. That is, this is my truth. This is true for me. Your truth is good for you. My truth is good for me. Your truth is good for you. Everybody go up, claps. But it's nonsense. It's utter nonsense if you think about it. Two plus two always equals four. It never equals five, no matter how badly I want it to equal five. No matter how sincere I am in my belief that it equals five, no matter how much I argue with my bank that it equals five, it never equals five. Gravity always pulls downward, no matter how much I wish it didn't work that way. Truth is truth. Especially in the spiritual realm, we like to create our own truth. The Bible says there is a truth, and the faith is built on truth. Secondly, the Bible teaches us that faith is also trust. Back to the movie clip for a second. What caused the man in black, who is actually the hero Wesley, dressed up like the Dread Pirate Roberts, if you're keeping score, uh, but what causes him to accept the rope thrown by Inigo Montoya? Well, he didn't trust him as a Spaniard. He didn't, uh, he knew he was waiting around to kill him, but he trusted him when he said, I swear on the sword of my father, Domingo Montoya, will reach the top alive. Throw me the rope, he said. Every man trusts something for some reasons. We trust our cars to start up every day without exploding in our faces. There's gas in cars. I don't know how cars work, but I trust it every day to start up without blowing me to smithereens. Or I trust that the wheels won't fall off in the middle of the highway going 70 miles an hour. We trust our cars. We trust our banks to keep track of our money appropriately. Most of us do. We trust our computers to keep our information. We trust things every day. And trust begins with truth and evidence. We have enough evidence to put our trust in something. But beyond that, truth is a matter, excuse me, trust is a matter of the heart. Which is why broken trust is so devastating in relationships. Because trust involves the heart. We're seeing unfold this massive scandal right now with General David Petraeus. 
and all the other stuff around that. It's, when trust is broken, it's devastating. And the God, we've been hammering away at the heart for the last few weeks as we take word by word. The gospel, it says, believe in your heart that Christ rose from the dead and you'll be saved. Believe in your heart. The heart is the center of the person, we said, where we make our decisions and our commitments. Repentance involves a change of heart as well as a change of mind and a change of direction. And faith is a matter of the mind that is evidence. God never expects us to put our mind in a, in a box, in a drawer. He expects to use us, our mind and our intelligence. But faith then becomes a matter of the heart. And because it is the heart, trust is also surrender. Because you put your self, your life, your hopes in the hands of another. This is what we do when we get married. We put our lives, our trust, our heart in the hands of another. It's what we do in a different way when we get on an airplane. Think about it. You get on an airplane, you put your, trust, your life in the hands of someone you don't even know who's going to fly that plane. And an air traffic controller, you don't even know. Okay? We can do that with people we don't know. We do it with people we love. But we all have faith. The question is, in who or in what do we put our faith? And the Bible says that faith is saying to God, throw me the rope. Faith is saying to God, I have enough evidence. I've studied enough. I see enough. I, I base my faith on truth. I believe you're telling me the truth. Throw me the rope. And I'll trust the rope that you throw. Th uh, lastly, we're talking about faith. We need to talk about a faith that requires action. Faith requires action. I had a conversation with a, um, a man a few years ago who actually happened to be uh, one of the coaches that one of my boys had at the time. And this particular coach was, was known by the kids and by others as, as uh, occasionally having uh, rather rough language. And as I met him, he found out I was a pastor, and a lot of times that changes the conversation when they, people find that out. It changes the kind of words they use and so forth. And um, he found that out, and he goes, oh, well, you know, we talked a little bit. He goes, well, you know, I'm a, his, his, his quote was, I'm a spiritual man, I'm just not a religious man, he said. I'm a spiritual man, but I'm just not a religious man. And I kind of got what he was saying, and in a way that makes some sense. But I think what he was really trying to explain was why he doesn't go to church anywhere. And he was also trying to explain why sometimes his language is what it is. I'm spiritual, but not terribly religious. All right? Look at what James says in James chapter 2. If you have your Bible, slip ahead to James chapter 2. Uh, verses 14 to 19. Uh, we covered this in uh, one of our sermons recently here at FBCG. This will be a little bit of repeat for you. But if you weren't here, James 2, verse 14. talks about the relationship of faith and action. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but have, has no deeds? Can such a faith save him? Suppose, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. In other words, believing something is useless unless that faith produces certain actions. James is saying that genuine faith produces real, tangible actions action. Now, James is not saying that we can earn salvation by doing good things. The gospel is salvation by faith alone. Salvation is a gift that comes to us by faith, not by anything we do. You, nobody's going to get into heavens today because they've got a big, giant suitcase full of good stuff they've done, because you've got a great resume. Nobody's going to get into heaven on, based on that. You're going to get into heaven based on what you do with, with the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for your sin. But James is saying genuine faith always expresses itself outwardly. That faith should be visible. That faith should make a difference. Sometimes Christians are defined by what they don't do. And I kind of grew up in a faith like that. I kind of grew up in a church that was very conservative, and I learned that Christians didn't swear, Christians didn't smoke, Christians didn't drink, Christians didn't go to movies. First movie my parents allowed us to go see was Born Free because it was about lions. I pointed out later the lions were naked, so, you know. I learned that we were defined by what we did not do. That's not what the Bible says here. It says we're defined and our faith is validated by what we do, by how we behave. The specific example here is compassion and generosity. You see someone in need, you say, hey, I hope your day goes well, but you don't do anything about it. What good are you? God says. 
Now, there are other ways in Scripture that tell us our faith makes a difference. Our faith should make a difference in how we talk and how we speak to people and about people. Should make a difference how we treat people. Should make a difference in how we invest our resources. Should make a difference in how we do our jobs. Should make a difference in how we love our wives and how we love our children. It should make a difference. That's what James is saying. Begins with our minds, with evidence, with truth. Proceeds through our hearts in trust, throw me the rope, and comes out then through the way we live and the way we behave. Sometimes my boys and I will be watching TV, a lot of times watching some sporting event, and quite often they'll see some famous athlete or some college guy, and they'll see something that he does. Not long ago it was, it was a couple of guys knelt on the football field next to an injured opponent. Not a teammate, but an opponent. They knelt for a moment and appeared to be praying on TV. Nobody said anything about it, but I, and my, boys go, my boy goes, I wonder if that guy's a Christian. That kid, that number 37. See what he's doing there? I wonder if he's a Christian. Or they hear somebody say something at a press conference that just sounds uniquely humble or respectful. And they'll say, huh, I bet that guy's a Christian. In other words, they're watching and noticing what's coming out of someone, and from there they're making inferences about that person's faith, where they've put their trust. And it always makes me wonder, when I hear them do that, I wonder if, if my faith, if who, I, who, I, who I've said throw me the rope to, if my faith leaks out enough, in my day-to-day -day life. Not when I'm here at church. That's easy. But I'm out there. Does it leak out enough so that someone watching from a distance would go, hmm, I bet that guy's a Christian. Makes me wonder. Here's the questions I want you to do around your table today. Three questions. First, if it's true that every man is capable of great faith, where or in what do men tend to invest their faith? Now here I want you to just go around your table and make a list. List Five, ten, fifteen places we tend to put our faith because we're capable of faith. That should be easy for you to do. Secondly, what role has doubt or questioning played in your own faith? I told the story of Hugh Ross. He was curious. He had lots of questions. Uh, doubt, to me, is not the opposite of faith. It actually is part of creating faith. What role, what, maybe doubt's playing a role in your faith right now, but what role does doubt or questioning play in your own faith? Third, can you identify one way in which you think God would like you to act on your faith? For example, would he want you to watch your tongue in certain situations? Uh, does he want you to commit an act of ridiculous generosity? Uh, does he want you to share your faith story? Some of you this past week, if you did your homework, were working on writing down your faith story on one page. Is it looking for a place to share that? Maybe with one of your children who doesn't know your story. Uh, is it offering to pray with someone? Some of you guys bring prayer requests to me week by week. Have you offered to, to pray for that person personally and see what happens in that situation? But what do you think God might be asking you to do to make your faith outward? All right? Take, take uh, some time, uh, get coffee, get a donut, and talk about these three things. I'll describe homework for you when we get uh, back together. Right before. So like uh, Brian gave us three questions there at the end of that, and if you look in your books as well, as he was talking about how our faith reveals itself, the, the action there is third point, faith is, is, is an action. The byproduct of our faith is our capacity or our willingness or our choice to act out in faithfulness in order to demonstrate faith, to reveal faith, to show that faith is real in us, we then become men who are faithful to the promises that we've made, to the, to the expectations, to that which we've said we would do, um, is, is one of the byproducts of our faithfulness. He gave us a couple questions there. Where, where do we put our faith, talking about building that list of, of things that we have a tendency to put our faith in? What is the role of, of doubt or questioning in, in our faith, and where have your experiences been with that, and um, and can you identify a way to act out your faith? I think there's an opportunity to get into this question of faithfulness. As we talk about how do we live out, how do we act out our faith, is there a way for us to talk about our capacity, areas where we have opportunities to be faithful as a demonstration of our faith, whether that's in the context of our families, our, our jobs, um, our neighborhoods, wherever that is, 
Um, where do people, because I think that's a unique thing in our culture. We almost, we almost have an expectation that, that somebody's got an angle or that somebody's going to let us down or that they won't come through. I think as Christ followers, when we live it out, when they see it in action, when we're true to our word, when, when we honor the vows that we've made to our wives, when those things are real in our lives, that stands out in our culture and there's opportunity there. So you can dive into those questions. There's a couple questions in your books as well. I'll be um, back at that table there in the corner. If anybody has prayer requests, um, I can collect those as well and we'll pray for those at the end of the morning. So grab some more coffee or an extra donut and we'll get into these questions.